Hello and welcome to this very special interview. Joining me now is India's top law officer, Mukul Rohatgi, the new Attorney General of India. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for talking to us. I remember when I last interviewed you, I asked you, am I talking to the future Attorney General? And you said, you'll cross the bridge when it comes. The bridge came, you've crossed it. Hartkis, congratulations Thank on you. your new appointment. Thank you. On his last day in the court, the outgoing Solicitor General spoke to me. And he outlined a fairly disturbing picture of the manner in which uh, there were no briefs, he said, given on time. There was no coordination between ministries. He said there were times when law officers had to go to court without even being adequately briefed. You would agree, Mr. Rohadgi, that the kind of relationship both between the executive and the judiciary and perhaps the handling of cases within the government perhaps went through uh, an extremely uh, deplorable, if I may use a very strong word, kind of a situation. Is that your top priority to fix that? Yes. Uh, see, I have had an earlier stint in the Vajpayee government for five years from 99 to 2004. I had also experienced some similar situations as Mr. Parasaran must have told you, that the briefs were not there, papers were incomplete, at times instructions were wanting. It seems to me that there has been a disconnect between the concerned ministry whose case has to come to the Supreme Court and the law ministry which has a central agency in the Supreme Court. That disconnect has been there for a number of years. I have also experienced it. And uh, my first task will be to try and ensure that there is complete connectivity between the litigant, so to say, that is the concerned ministry, and the law ministry which handles it in the Supreme Court, which involves the office of the AG and other law officers. Another very important uh, area is to see that delays which occur in filing of appeals on behalf of the Government of India are reduced. The delays at times can be in hundreds of days and sometime or the other good cases suffer because delay is enormous and is not explainable because there is a movement from bureaucrat to bureaucrat or desk to desk and sometimes cases are lost on that account also. So it will be my endeavour to ensure that the delays are minimised. Now one can have recourse to modern technology. Everything is available on email. It was not so 15 years ago when I was there in the government earlier as a law officer. So we will try and have a connectivity, try and have a, a data bank to find out what is the status of matters which arise from the High Court to the Supreme Court to track. You know, it's like a GPS. If you have a GPS in a car, you can know where you are going and somebody else can also track the movement of your car. So similarly, we will try and ensure that we are able to track where the file is, where the cases are and uh, have proper responsibility of all government lawyers to ensure that they do their designated jobs within specified time. The period of filing an appeal is 90 days in the Supreme Court plus time taken to obtain a copy. So usually it's about 120 to 150 days. I think that is sufficient time for an appeal to be filed. If a private person can file it in a few days if necessary, I am sure the government should be able to do it in three to four months, which is good enough. So that is the first objective which I want to uh, achieve in whatever little way I can. You must understand that I am only, or my office is only one uh, out of many offices with which it is concerned. It's not only in my hands because somebody is conducting a case, say, in Calcutta. Suppose it applies to the case of the Steel Ministry. So first they have to decide whether they should appeal or not. If they want advice, it will come to the Law Ministry, then the advice goes back and 
so on and so forth. So there are many, many steps. So idea is to curtail the number of steps and curtail the number of lawyers who handle it at different stages. So if you're going to have 10 lawyers handling it from stage A to stage Z, obviously it's going to take time. So these are the things which I, which I feel. And in fact, I discussed it with the law secretary yesterday. And he was also quite appreciative of what we should do. So it's it's a collective effort. I mean, it's not only that I can I can only aspire to do things, but unless I have the the uh, inspiration, if I may use the phrase, of the ministry and the concerned stakeholders, but that's what I. The do. position, uh, sir, that you now hold is also very significant because you're not just the government's top lawyer, you're also in many ways the bridge between the government and the judiciary. And in the past, there have been uh, uh, several instances, uh, and we've talked about this in the past, about uh, why judicial overreach happened, why the judiciary had to step in, uh, and the view was that in many occasions it found that the executive was not doing its job. Yes, how do you, do you first of all believe that there is a scope for repairing the kind of, uh, what should I say, lack of confidence that the judiciary seems to have developed in the executive, which is what made it step in? See, see first of all, I personally believe that the present government, under the leadership of the Prime Minister, is and will be a strong government it will take steps and decisions at appropriate times and if the executive works in the way that it is supposed to work the courts will work in the field in which they are supposed to work that's number one number two it will be my endeavor to assure the court that the government is not interested in a conflict the idea is to work together in the judicial delivery system, as you are aware, and it's elementary, there are a large number of stakeholders, whether it's the government, whether it's a private litigant, whether it's the lawyers, whether it's the courts, everybody must work together and strive to ensure that there is equilibrium between different fields, between different uh, spheres, and I don't think that there should be any problem. I don't foresee any problem. I want to touch upon a very important issue that uh, we have discussed in the past, and I'm not going into specifics, but I want to understand the larger issue. Whether it was the telecom sector, or the mining sector, or the coal allocation process, these are all mired in litigation, sir. Do you believe that there is, now that we have a, a, a new government, uh, is there scope do you feel to be able to go to the courts, first figure out an executive plan of action and then go to the courts and say let's do it this way if you approve and let's leave the past behind and move on. Do you believe that that should be a more constructive way rather than litigating and... I entirely agree with you but you must, must understand and keep in view that this government has inherited all these problems. It's not a creation of this government. It has inherited all these problems which are uh, in all critical sectors, as you mentioned, coal, telecom, iron ore, etc., etc. And uh, I am sure that the government under the PM and the ministers concerned will take a proactive stand so as to remove the clouds of uncertainty, whether it's coal or whatever and maybe take a proactive view, provide a sustainable solution and one can certainly go to the court and the court I am sure will appreciate the fact that the government has been proactive, it has come forward with some kind of solution. Let the past be bygones be bygones, let's look at the future, try and clear these clouds of uncertainty which are hovering over the economy. And if, if one is able to clear uh, some of these clouds and doubts, etc., I am sure that one can steam ahead as the way it should be, so that the economy again, uh, you know, becomes better, the GDP rises, 
the fiscal deficits are reduced, litigation is kind of brought under control because litigation today has gone out of control. In fact, that's a very important point you're making, sir, because I'm sure in your illustrious career on the other side, it has been seen that when an economic reality has been presented before the courts, they've not been totally shut away from it. It's just that perhaps the criticism of the previous government was that it never really took it seriously enough to present uh, the larger economic damage that was being done. And, and that's, would you say, would be the approach, at least, on various issues? As I told you, the approach will be, should be positive, and I will try to make it proactive. There is no reason to assume that the court will not look at it understandingly. Neither the court nor the government is interested in a confrontation. Every sphere must work properly. It's like a well-oiled machine, you know, unless it, every part works properly, the machine will break up. And uh, these solutions can first be found on the desk of the government or the desk of the law ministry. And then it can be placed before the court that this is what the roadmap is, this is what the roadmap on which the government or the lawyers of the government want to go. And I'm sure the court will be cooperating. Why not? One of the biggest concerns that uh, citizens of this country face is the fact that you touched upon it earlier, the huge backlog of cases, the enormous amount of litigation that is going on. Uh, we've had some comments which have been made by the Chief Justice and some previous ones as well. The current Chief Justice of the Supreme Court has even come out with a radical suggestion that let's work all 365 days. What is your own view? How, how can the system per se See, uh, see uh, it's, a, it's obvious that the burden is staggering. There are a couple of crore cases which are pending in various courts, the least in the Supreme Court. But since the task is so daunting, very, very aggressive and radical measures are required. Firstly, working for 365 days, as I said yesterday to the press, is somewhat impractical. I mean, uh, the nature of work is such that lawyers cannot work 365 days, neither can judges. But I think it's a well-meaning suggestion, and I said that yesterday. We can certainly look at reducing the number of holidays. The huge holidays which the courts enjoy, at least the higher courts enjoy, was a, is a relic of the British uh, era, where the British judges would go back to England uh, by sea, because there were no aeroplanes those days. That's why the vacations used to be 10 weeks in summer in the Supreme Court, which are now down to 6. So that can be uh, reduced. But let me tell you, by reducing the vacations by another 2 weeks to 4 weeks in a year, is not going to bring down 2 crore cases to 1 crore or 50 lakhs. There is no way it will happen. According to me, a multi-pronged attack of a radical nature is required. Radical in the sense you have to first reduce and weed out redundant laws. There are huge number of laws in this country from the British era which are still operative, which have no meaning today. Times have changed, but nobody has had a look to weed them out. In fact, I read an article today in the paper that there is some committee which the government has appointed or is appointing to try and weed out 10 laws in a week, or etc., etc. That's a must. And that can be done by experts like the Law Commission. Law Commissions have been there for a number of years. A lot of their reports have gathered dust, not been implemented. But today we have an excellent uh, chairman of the Law Commission, Mr. Justice A.P. Shah, whom I know well who has always uh, the very good judge, been a good judge, hardworking person, a thinker. He delivered the judgment in Article 377 in the High Court, which was reversed by the Supreme Court. So first is you read, read out large number of redundant laws, obscure laws. Number two, you have to cut out the number of appeals. There is no country which provides an appeal against, let's say, a petty assessment order of the Income Tax Department from the assessing office to the right up to the Supreme Court. 
civil suits from the lower court right up to the Supreme Court. You have to reduce the number of appeals. You have to cut out approaches to higher courts in a pending case which stall the hearing. You know, for a number of years, you get a stay, it stalls the hearing. Time can be limited for oral arguments. Oral arguments in this country at times have gone on for weeks and months and couple of months. I am sure that can be curtailed. It should be curtailed. Nowhere in the world do you have any number of days to argue a case. You can have a suggestion of written arguments at the end of limited oral arguments. Adjournments can be strictly monitored. Things like that, unless all these things are implemented together, which is a five or a six item multi-pronged approach, there is no way the areas will come down. I had given one or two suggestions in the papers also. For example, there are parallel proceedings. Take check bouncing cases. What is the idea? To put the fear of God in somebody whose check is bounced, then he may go to jail. But those cases now go on for five years or ten years. There is no fear left. To recover money, a check bouncing case filed in the criminal court may or may not get you the money. So to recover the same amount of money, you have to file a civil case. So two parallel proceedings are commenced to recover money against a bounce check. Another uh, double uh, workload on the judicial system. On the litigant, he hires a civil lawyer, he hires a criminal lawyer, and it goes on endlessly. So why not, why can't you have the same judge delivering the civil judgment and a criminal judgment? Stuff like that. So if, you know, one thinks out of the box, and I'm sure the stakeholders are lawyers also, litigants also. The lawyers can well, uh, you know, practicing lawyers can give you practical suggestions. It cannot only be done by the bureaucracy or by the ministry. So we, everybody needs to put his head together, take the benefit of experience of judges, retired judges, lawyers, litigants, academicians, people who are adept at court management. You know, things we have no court management really. Supreme Court has started doing some things of court management. You have a database of cases, etc., etc. Look at uh, criminal cases. There are hundreds and thousands of appeals which are pending in various forums from district court to high court, supreme court, where people have put in 5 years to 10 years to 15 years as either an under trial or where a matter is pending in appeal. So what happens if a man is acquitted of murder after 15 years? 15 years of his life is gone. In foreign countries, if this happens, they are compensated. In India, we, we can't have that compensation. We are a poor nation. We are a developing economy. So it is very, very urgent that you have a relook at the criminal justice dispensation system. There are also a lot of procedures. There are old procedures which have been carrying on from the British times, from the ideal times. All those you know, things have to be weeded out. And uh, I mean, I can only make suggestions. You know, It's not in my hand to either pass a law or to ensure that the pendency comes down. Let me talk about one issue that you and I have always talked about for the last two or three years, the, the hammer blow that was dealt through the retrospective tax amendment. You've told me, and in fact in the last interview you told me that the next government, of course we didn't know at that time who the next government will be, you said the next government must remove. You were so vehement about it. Now we have a new government, you're the Attorney General. If your view was sought, would you hold on to your earlier belief that let's get on with it? This has caused enormous amount of pain to the rest of the world, to the global investors. Let's put an end to this, repeal this and move ahead. I would be in favor of repeal of the retrospective law. I am sure the finance minister would be having a close look at it. He has been a good lawyer. He is aware of the practical situations. He is aware of the, the impact it has had on the economy, on foreign investment, etc., etc. He must be busy with the budget today, and this is an aspect of the budget. 
I am sure he'll take a call. And uh, but you know his call is a macro call. My call is a micro call. By saying that you know this doesn't seem appropriate that you bring in a law with effect from 1962. It's, it's kind of it doesn't kind of gel. I am sure he'll take a call. Let's see what they do. There is this uh, raging debate on transparency in judicial appointments. We are right now seeing an incident playing out in the media. Uh, judicial accountability was again a legislation which is on the table. What, what, what is your view on that? See, I have said yesterday, and the press has reported it. I'll tell you again. According to me, these are experiments. For the first 40-50 years after independence, the government had the absolute right to appoint judges. After the judges' case, for the last 20 years or 25 years, the court took over the function. So these were two extremes, only the government and only the court, with a little input from the government. But the government's view is not final. And the Supreme Court has the right to override the government view. That's a legal position. The third experiment can be and should be a judicial accountability or appointment bill as is being uh, proposed having a national commission. That, according to me, would be a middle path. No extreme, bring in people from both sides, have other stakeholders, have an eminent lawyer or two who knows the courts. And let me tell you, nobody knows the reputation of a judge better than a practicing lawyer. Whether it's of the High Court, whether it's of the Supreme Court. So you need to have stakeholders, all the stakeholders, government, the judiciary, Lawyers, pick out good lawyers who have no individual stake in X becoming or Y becoming. Should also have the views of litigants. But how do you have litigants' view? You can have an NGO who do large number of cases in the courts, in the Supreme Court, in the High Court. That is what the commission is. That a lot of people sit together, give out suggestions, talk about names. People give their inputs about names. In America, you have a public debate when a judge of the court is appointed or when a president is appointed. You know, president and the, the other side will have a debate. President-elect of both sides will have a debate. So that's the way to look at it. And according to me, it will be experiment number three. So why not have it? Let's see where it goes. Are you against uh, the bringing of black money back to India? Never. Never. It's unfortunate that Mr. I was told that Mr. Jetvalani had written a letter to somebody saying that I am opposed to it. I have never made a comment. I know you've maintained a very I have never ever made a comment dignified silence. That black money should not be brought. I don't know. His facts are all wrong from where he's got them. He's not cared to check with me. And I don't think any right meaning person in this country can say that black money stashed away in different uh, heavens should not be brought back. If money is brought back, it will certainly help the economy and uh, it will bring offenders to book or whatever. But that's, that's how those letters were written. But I have never ever said that black money should not be brought back. One of, one of the, uh, in fact, I remember recently one of the judges on the bench had to even remark when it came to the appointment of an environment regulator that we've seen it in the manifesto uh, of the previous government uh, or the party which ran that government, but uh, we are yet to see it. Uh, there have been several such instances where the judiciary has said we would like this to happen and it has not see, happened. See, as far as the yeah. regulator is concerned, regulator was required to be appointed under the law. It was not appointed. And environment is a very, very important, uh, exactly. a very, very important aspect. It's an aspect of personal life and liberty which has been read into uh, by the Supreme Court that everybody has a right to lead a healthy life and have a healthy environment, therefore. 
so they should have appointed a regulator so only in the last days last couple of months that uh, it was pointed out to the forest bench there is a bench in the supreme court called the forest bench consisting of three honorable judges which deal with environment cases that the government had not appointed and therefore the court directed by its order i think passed in march or april that you must appoint a regulator now this was something where the executive should have acted right he should have acted but he didn't act and therefore the court had to step in so that's how and, and, and would it be your clear desire and effort to make sure that at least in this government such things don't happen obviously as i said the the, the action of this government and it seems to be uh, taking decisions at the right time the government has come in only what 20 days ago it's only 20 days and they have inherited a huge number of problems they will have to be sorted out one by one and uh, a good proactive approach i think will be taken we have uh, as far as i am concerned we have a good law minister who has been a good lawyer that's very very important who has been a good lawyer who is aware of the system we have uh, a great finance minister who's been a lawyer i'm talking only of those whom i know personally very well and i'm sure the others will also be of the same metal and they'll carry on i wish you all the very best thank sir, you rahat ji in your thank meetings you. thank you thank very you much